Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. And important. 
And for all of us today, thinking about the Middle East, we despair. We say, oh, the conflict, and it's horrible, and I hope that it's over there, and leave it be. Well, the world's too small for us to leave things be. It's way too small. We're all connected. Uh, and when you read Ted's book, you see the flow of history, the human drama that has created uh, wonder and horror in that region and in our world. But what really strikes me about Ted's book is it's not about just conflict. It's about connection. It's about human stories. Um, you'll see in the illustrations that there's movement, waves. That's all I see when I look at Ted's work. He sees history as a flowing stream, as do I. Uh, and it gives me great hope, actually. I do not despair when I look at the world today. And I don't think that Ted does either, because he sees the big scope of things. So that's the book. And finally, about the author, uh, who I respect uh, tremendously, who I love very much. Ted is a man who is an artist, a historian, um, a scholar, and more than that, a wonderful, wonderful old poet, and a wonderful human being, the likes of which you just don't come across every day. So Ted, we love you, and can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> You're gonna you bring me to tears. <laughs> Actually, you stole my bit, my beginning line too, <laughs> about call, you know sending me emails from Baghdad about drinking your scotch and filling you on the west and the end of the, end of the edge of the world. But actually, it reminds me of something very funny you said here, nowhere near so exotic as Baghdad, when someone said, "Well, what's it like settling the issues in the Middle East? Is it really difficult?" <laughs> and you said, "Oh, well." Not so bad as Cannon Square. <laughs> so thank you, and thank you all for coming. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, also, I'd like to thank the Library Committee for asking me to come again. And I gave this a talk, oh, I think in 2009. I have, when I first presented this work, and I have since added many more drawings and refined the ideas into a series of drawings and texts that Nan, my wife, made into a book. I didn't do it, she did it. It called The Eastern Question, which portrays history as a play. That play, as I see it, is a drama, tragical, comical, and historical in the praise of Polonius, the character Polonius in Hamlet. Tragical because people do die. Comical because life goes on. And historical because it's true. There is no other story. There are six characters in the play representing the main geopolitical elements in the world west of India. The plot is driven by three geopolitical dynamics, oscillations between the opposites of desert and zone, east and west, and order and fragmentation, or disorder. In the 19th century, the Eastern question was, what was going to happen when the sick old man of the Ottoman Empire finally died? The question eventually led to the outbreak of war in 1914. Today, it's still a question. What's going to happen in the lands of the FOE, the former Ottoman Empire, AKA the Middle East? The drama of the Eastern question is still a cliffhanger. If you came looking for answers, sorry, I don't have any just observations on the underlying dynamics of geopolitics that we can see active in the world today, like deep ocean currents upwelling on the surface of the sea. I make no judgments. A natural phenomenon 
is not to be judged on a moral scale of one's own invention, nor do I make predictions. I mean, really, how accurate are the predictions of meteorologists about the phenomena of weather? Nowadays, people, as Scott pointed out, are puzzled by what they call the Middle East mess, which is natural because for the West, the East has always been a puzzle or a question. And anyway, how did we in the US get sucked down into this big old mess? Everyone, it seems, wants to blame someone, anyone, anything, Obama, Hillary, George Bush II. But how about the Suez Crisis of 1956, or the overthrow of Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953, or the creation of Israel as a state in 1947, or the Cairo Conference of 1921 that drew the famous line to the desert, or the so-called Peace Conference held in Paris in 1919, or the Balfour Declaration of 1917, or the infamous Sykes-Picot Sykes Agreement of 1916, or the Balfour Declaration, or the entangling treaties and agreements that are blamed for the war. Or maybe we should just go back to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, or back to the failed Ottoman siege of Vienna in 1683, or back to the taking of Jerusalem by the Crusaders in 1099, or the founding of an Ottoman state in the same year, or back to the fall of Jerusalem to the first caliph in 637, five years after the death of the prophet Muhammad. But in truth, it would be more accurate historically to blame it on the Babylonians. I mean, really, there is no one else, no particular conference, no battle, not one single historical event, but just the enrolling of the historical process driven by dynamics that have been active in that process since the year zero. A.M. Anno Mundi, the year of the world. When humans, year zero is when the humans first settled on the land and began to till, till the soil, plant crops, build cities, and kingship was lowered from heaven, as they thought, and kings and emperors began fighting over the same lands in the cockpit of conflict, starting with the Babylonians, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Hittites, Assyrians, and finally Persians or Iranians, whose histories deter are deter were determined by the dynamic of the succession of states. For them, the future was the past, and they went forward looking forward, as in rowing. Here is the cuneiform concept of this, of this for this word, barkatu, meaning past and present are the same. It is not a bad way of looking at time, in the perspective of which Mesopotamia occupies more than half of all time lived since the year zero, in the year of the world, the Hebrew calendar, the oldest calendar, perfected by Maimonides in Cordoba, in medieval Muslim Spain. This past September, we celebrated Rosh Hashanah, New Year 5776. Curiously, it corresponds to the beginning in the middle of the fourth century BC of what is called civilization. In the perspective of those 5,776 years, Mesopotamian history occupies more than half the clear preponderance of human experience on this planet since the world appeared out of the tohu and bohu of original chaos. The West's paltry share of those five millennia and more is nothing in comparison to that of Mesopotamia where people saw the past controlling the present as well as the ever unrolling future. They saw history as a tree springing from the well-watered land, or Iraq in Arabic, the cradle of world civilization, the fertile crescent, the petri dish of the world, the original sown, or planted land, the world egg, outside of which 
the desert was the desert from whence came the invaders who have been the primary movers of history right up to the present with new migrations of humans driven by economic want or political necessity, the most migrating, it is said, since the Second World War. Even today, with texting and Twitter, Twitter, migrating is still a perilous undertaking, being forced through the semi-permeable membranes of borders by unequal pressure on one side of the membrane or the other, as in the physical phenomenon of osmosis, moving upon the surface of the earth, where some places are better for human habitation than others. In history, this movement has largely been from east to west, from the steppes of Asia, but it has also come from the south, from the vasty wilds of wide Arabia. A third dynamic is inextricably interwoven with these first two, that is, the oscillation between order and fragmentation, a pattern a pattern or dynamic pointed out in the 14th century by the Tunisian historian Ibn Khaldun in his Muqaddimah. He, he observed that semi-nomadic peoples living on the borders of the settled land moved into the zone in vast waves. Often they destroy the existing order and force the emergence of a new order, but then as settlers they themselves become prey to the next wave of nomads coming out of the desert or off the steppes or from the sea. Ontologically speaking, what nomads do is move. And in the history of mankind, there have been three principal means of moving, moving by horse, by camel, and by ship. Seen from an imaginary point of view, high up in outer space, the Earth might seem like an enormous hive of human insects, teeming, swarming, moving this way and that over its variegated surface. The horse, the camel, and the ship were respectively the keys to three geopolitical fortresses. The horse to the steppe, the camel to the desert, the ship to the sea. To the ancients, the world egg was the ecumene, from the Greek word for house or dwelling, the place where people lived or inhabited, that is, the inhabited world, outside of which were the horse and camel people. Imagine this ecumene as a house with three courtyards representing three characters in the drama. The western courtyard represents the Western Roman Empire, later the West, and across the Atlantic, the US. The middle courtyard represents the Eastern Roman Empire, later the Byzantine, later the Ottoman Empire. The third easternmost courtyard represents Persia, high up on the Iranian plateau, behind the Zagros Mountains. In between these courtyards are the borderlands, the killing fields of history, reading from west to east, are the Adriatic, Malta, and the Balkans, the border between the Eastern and Western Roman empires, and then Iraq, the border between the Romans and Persians, and then Afghanistan, lying to the east of Persia, the end of the known world. From these three developed the three main characters in the play. The Western Empire first had to go through its Holy Roman Empire phase, a soi-disant empire, neither holy nor Roman, and then it had to go through its EU and NATO stage, while Russia, coming out of the Byzantines, saw herself as a third Rome after the fall of the second Constantinople. Then, when she became the Soviet Union, she had to go through her Warsaw Pact <coughs> stage, and the Persians had to go through their Ayatollah stage, and still are in it. Just in case you think this is all pure fantasy, here is the map of the Ecumene projected onto some real geography. Outside of it, you can see three other characters, not part of the original ecumene, the Russians, the Arabs, and the US of A. These are the six characters in my dramatis personae to, hum to whom I assign what I call my historian's colors after a line 
from Elizabeth Bishop's geography, more beautiful than the historians of the map maker's colors. It's a bit hard to read, so you'll have to buy the book after. <laughs> I'm done with my head. You may very well ask, how did I come to think these wild things? <coughs> well, at the time of 9-11, I had a printing shop downtown in Manhattan, not very far from the World Trade Center. I was a scholar printer, not only working in the trade, but studying the history of printing, which begins in the Renaissance. Here is a library of that printing shop where I first began my inquiries, the original Greek sense of our world history. Here history began to suggest itself to me in images, and Nan's research, fresh images, begot. From the perspective of these studies, I learned the significance of the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, and how to the West it seemed the worst possible imaginable disaster, the loss of the remnant of the old classical ancient world which the humanists were trying their best to revive. For if Islam, it was the victory prophesied in the Quran. The fall of Rome is announced. When, in October 2001, Osama bin Laden, in one of his broadcasts in classical Arabic, claimed that the tax were inventions for what had, had, what had ha happened 80 years before. And it occurred to me that he was talking of the fall of the Ottoman Empire to the West and the abolishment of the Sultanate and Caliphate by Western-leaning, secularizing Turkish nationalists at the end of the First World War, and that it represented a complete reversal of the conquest of 1453, and that he was really thinking in the scale not of 80, but of 800 years, going back to the sack of Jerusalem by the Crusaders in 1099, and the founding of the Ottoman state in that very same year. The Byzantine and Ottoman empires were successor states to the same land as had been the Mesopotamian <coughs> kingdoms. Here you can see them, top and bottom. The Byzantine empire had been the Eastern Roman Empire, the birthplace of Christianity, home to the seven churches in Asia, meaning Anatolia. The Ottoman Turks were the last of the great invaders from the east. But of all these invaders, it was Attila who cut the deepest into, into European history. Imagine him as a pool player, striking the racked up walls of the tribes, and with one powerful stroke, scattering them, the Angles and Saxons into Britain, and the Northern Italians into the Venetian lagoon, he forced the Franks and Gauls to unite with the Roman provincials, creating France. He gave the Pope great prestige by allowing himself to be turned back near Milan. He scattered the, Slav the Slavs south, west, and east to become Yugoslavia, Bohemia, and Russia. These invaders were really one people. They were the Turks, who saw the, ge who saw the geography of the world in the same way with better grazing and cities plunder to the west. <coughs> Herding their flocks, <coughs> sorry, my, my mouth is getting dry. <coughs> Herding their flocks with them, they were a people in movement. They increased in numbers as they moved like reindeer across miles and miles of frozen moss silently and very fast. The peoples they encountered, <laughs> you know who that comes from. <laughs> the, people were, the peoples they encountered irresistibly joined the moving horde, and eventually they created a vast empire, an empire that spanned the entire continent of Asia, from the Pacific to the Mediterranean, almost to Africa. They were turned back in Israel by the Egyptian Mamluks. <laughs> In Japan, a, do, a do, divine wind, in Japanese, kamikaze, destroyed their fleet. Like a great glacier, the Mongols left 
a radically altered landscape when they retreated. They were the first people to understand globalization, and they created a new world order. After the glacier had receded, it left Russia under the czars, or Caesars, heirs of Rorik the Norman. But claiming the Roman emperor's title and ruling over the East Slavs as successors of the Khans down to Putin through that Tatar Lenin <coughs> and his political successor, bad old Georgian Joseph Stalin, called behind his back, Genghis Khan with a telephone. <laughs> Imagine Russia as the Mongol Empire with a grand <coughs> European style facade designed by European architects <coughs> facing westward behind which stretch the steps of Asia. The autocratic power which has been for the last four centuries out of all comparison the most important factor in Russian history came out of the long domination of the Mongols reinforced by the Byzantine conception of the state, the keystone of the arch of imperial autocracy. Thinking like Mesopotamians, looking forward and backward, let's take a broad overview of a succession of states, of Turks, Mongols, Byzantines, and Russians, swirling around the heartland of Eurasia, eventually, the ch eventually challenging the West in the form of the Eastern question, not forgetting the first of the two great jihads, that from Arabia, which began the jihad against the West, leaving it to the Turks to complete in the second, with the conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Driven by the incantatory force of Arab poetry, for example, Gabriel's first words to Muhammad, Ikra bismi rabika lafi kalaka kalaka linsana minna halachim Recite in the name of the Lord, the cherisher, who created man from a clot of blood. With this wild music resonating and resounding inside their turbaned heads, in 633, the tribes burst out of the deserts of vast Arabia, led by the first caliphs, the Rashidun, or rightly guided. Within three years, they had taken Damascus. Within six more, they had taken Jerusalem, then all of Syria. Within a decade, Egypt and Armenia. Within two decades, Persia. And within three, Afghanistan and most of the Punjab. In 711, 711 having run the entire length of the north coast of Africa, they crossed into Spain at Gibraltar, <laughs> named for their general Tarek, the Hill of Tarek, or in Arabic, Hib al Tariq. Eventually, they crossed the Pyrenees into France, reaching the Loire, where, according to French legend, they were stopped by Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, the Hammer, in 732 exactly a century after the death of Muhammad. The original plan had been to take all of the European Peninsula in a pincer movement, but they failed to take Constantinople, the conquest of which was reserved for the second great jihad, that of the Ottoman Turks. These two jihads defined the limits of Europe and of today's EU. The two jihads brought the Western Empire to its end and led to the birth of its faint shadow, the Holy Roman Empire. In 962, Europe was not called Europe, but Christendom, and was only defined as such in contradistinction to Dar al Islam, the House of Islam. Even though highly divided internally, Christendom managed to survive the onslaught of a unified Islam. and all the incursions of Mongols, Huns, Arabs, and Turks due to one simple geographic fact. Europe is an extremely long peninsula. Any invader runs the risk of the overextended supply line, as did the Arabs. For a long time, the West, for the West, the East was the Ottoman Empire. Imagine a huge, 
African rhinoceros sticking its horns into the soft <laughs> underbelly. <laughs> Laughing, I can drink some more. <laughs> into the soft underbelly of Europe. In the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire was the present terror of the world. But by the 19th, it posed no more of a problem than that of the Eastern question, besides providing good subject matter for French painters. The Orient, Orientalists, Jérôme, Jericot, and Delacroix, with their bath scenes and beauties for sale in the slave market. Imagine the West, on the other hand, as a fortress built on a 16th century model for defense against the <coughs> empire. Its outermost wall, the counterstar, was the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire <coughs> preached in 1453 by the great gun made by a renegade Hungarian, ironically named Urban, the Pope who had launched the Crusades. This left Habsburg Catholic Southern Europe as the West's last rampart. The borderland between these two imperial behemoths was the Habsburg military frontier, or modern Croatia whose red and white checkerboard flag comes from that of the frontier. For, for this service, the Pope gave Croatia the title of Contramoralis Christianitatis. For centuries, the struggle of East and West was played out on a map resembling a football field, with teams advancing and retreating yard by yard between the goalposts of Vienna and Constantinople which the West finally reconquered in 1918, long after Dracula's overlord, John Hunyadi, the Voivoda of Transylvania, repulsed the siege of Belgrade in 1456, and John Sobieski, the king of Poland, turned the Turks back from the walls of Vienna in 1683. After Belgrade, the Pope ordered that a noon bell be rung in all the Hungarian churches. A tradition continues today. History has shown that fighting two-fronted wars is perilous. The Habsburgs could never devote their full strength to fighting the Ottomans for fear of the Protestants at their rear. Likewise, the Ottomans could never devote their full strength to fighting the Habsburgs for fear of the Shias at their rear. Let's pause to consider for a moment the big old Sunni thing, which originally stemmed from two very different understandings of legitimacy as caliph or successor of Muhammad, that is, between the claims of his descendants and those of his generals. It was a political dispute that morphed into a religious one and then hardened into a geopolitical reality along an ancient borderland between or from the 16th century on, that borderland was between the Shia Persians and the Sunni Ottomans, the successors, east and west, of the Persian Darius and the Greek Alexander. When Iraq was created as a state at the Cairo Conference in 1921, its administration remained Sunni, ruling over a primarily Shia population and the, and the three Shia holy cities of Najaf, Karbala and Samara, emphasizing Iraq's role as the borderland. In the 18th century, another character stepped onto the stage and provoked the Eastern question, that is, Russia. There now came to be two lords in the East, both contending over the red apple. The old goal of Muslim conquest of Rome, prophesied in the Surah Ahrum, meaning Constantinople, the second Rome. For the Russians, their goal was this new Rome, the holy city of Byzantium, after the fall of which they began to see holy Moscow as a third Rome. They were also seeking a warm water access to the world, as they still are today in Syria, with the ports of Latakia and Tartus, which Putin has just fortified. Imagine Russia as a great bear, lapping the warm waters of the Black Sea 
and with her right paw reaching toward the Slavs of the Balkans and the Straits of Constantinople, and through them breaking free from her landlocked position, and with her left paw reaching toward the weak continents of Asia, now known as the Stans, and threatening British India, the glittering jewel in the crown of that far-flung empire. This fear was the origin of the Russophobia that has lasted through the Cold War up to this very day. It lies at the heart of the Eastern question as classically defined in the terms of 19th century diplomatic history. Fear on both sides played out in the great game made famous by Rudyard Kipling, our former neighbor in Vermont, with his novel Kim, and was fought in the treacherous mountain passes of Afghanistan. In an attempt to answer the Eastern question, the present borders of Afghanistan were drawn to create a buffer state to ensure that claims on both sides would not touch at any point, creating the thin Wakhan corridor reaching as far east as China. In the 1870s, massacres in the Ottoman-controlled Balkans led to liberal outrage in England over the policy established by Lord Palmerston in the 1830s to support the Ottomans as another buffer state against Russian expansion extremes, and the Eastern question became a political football between the conserv conservative Disraeli, who as Prime Minister pursued Palmerston's policy, and the liberal Gladstone, who suddenly came out of retirement to overturn it on ethical grounds. And thus, the Ottoman Empire, the last prize of European colonial expansionism, came up for grabs in what might be called the sandbox of empire. <laughs> Everyone blames Britain, but the sudden rise of Germany upset the concert of Europe established by Metternich in 1814 and unleashed a world war. Plans for a German navy threatened Britain, and plans for building a railway from Berlin to Baghdad, an extension of Germany's old drawing out Alston, or drive to the east, and also of the luxurious Orient Express of romance, deeply threatened Russian interests. These conflicts led to the outbreak of war in 1914, and the denouement of the Eastern question. The Bolshevik Revolution put an end to Russia's imperialist ambitions, at least in theory, but other questions presented themselves to the victors of Versailles, Britain, France, and a new player, the US. What to do with the spoils? After the war, the treaty tables in Paris and its suburbs became the butcher blocks on which the carcasses of old empires were cut up by diplomats into new nations. It was the very end of the colonial expansion that had started in 1099 with the taking of Jerusalem by the Crusaders, the same year of the Ottoman Empire was founded by the swearing off of fealty to the Seljuks. The pro proposed partition of the Anatolian heartland of the, of the Ottoman Empire, the Treaty of Sev, was broken when Mustafa Kemal later known as Ataturk, the father of the Turks, the only undefeated Ottoman general, shattering, the pun is intended, the fragile treaty, landed at Samsun on the Black Sea coast, raised an army, and drove out the French, Italians, and Greeks, who had been promised pieces. It marked the start of the great colonial revolt that culminated with Indian independence in 1947. The same year, Israel was created by UN resolution. So how did the US of A get stuck with this ancient struggle? In the succession of states, there is no question that the US inherited the leadership of the West. The only question is, when? Generally, this is thought to have happened with the Suez Crisis of 1956, when the US forced Britain and France to back down 
from retaking the canal when Colonel Nasser occupied it. Imagine this as the passing of the baton from one relay runner, old and tired, to another, fresh, young, and naive. It's all yours, boys. The Foreign Office in Washington cabled. The Foreign Office in London cabled Washington. Meanwhile, Islam was rising again from its blue bleak embers. The revolt of Islam started in the 18th century with the anti-Western purifying Saudi Wahhabis and merged with the anti-colonial struggle fostered by the Comintern or the, Inter or the Third International, the Soviet program to spread the revolution to the world. What set the anti-colonial struggles of the Islamic world apart from those of Ataturk in Turkey or Gandhi in India was that, beginning in the 1970s, Islam had got a sort of oil. In the 1980s, the U.S. assisted the Mujahideen in their struggle against the Soviet Union in the mountains of Afghanistan with their treacherous passes and tribes and won the Cold War. The collapse of the Soviet Union left a dead dragon oozing the blood of world revolution. The Afghan war did for militant Islam what the Spanish Civil War had done for the communists. It gave the veterans an esprit de corps, it radicalized them, and gave them a sense of further mission. And with the Soviets gone, the mission of the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, turned westward. As Benazir Bhutto wrote just before her assassination, they had defeated one superpower. Why not another? Thus were sowed the seeds of a new war, another Afghanistan great game. Here is one way to diagram its narrative. Once upon a time, there was an old war between the Ottoman Empire the successor of the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire and the Christian West, which morphed into a so-called Cold War between the, successor of these, the successors of these geopolitical elements, between the Warsaw Pact countries, called the Eastern Bloc, and NATO, the West. But in the power vacuum left by the absence of an Eastern Empire, whether Byzantine, Ottoman, or Soviet, a new war erupted between the remaining superpower of the West and the remnants of the former Ottoman Empire. Great powers create and sustain order, promoting stability and toleration. Perhaps they were created by conquest and sustained by oppression, but their fragmentation creates disorder, strife, and war what fate of time decrees and into, and into the new power vacuum left by the weakness of the Iraqi state and a civil war in Syria, Sunni ISIS and Shia have moved. With the collapse of power in Kiev, Russia has moved into the Ukraine and Crimea into the power vacuum left by the overthrow of Gaddafi. Terrorist cells have arisen in the Saharan desert, just as three millennia before, into the power vacuum left by the collapse of the Brotherhood of Kings at the end of the second millennium BC. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold into the plains of Dabiq now controlled by the forces of ISIS, fervently desiring to bed, to behead any Western soldier, though preferably an American, who sets boot to the sacred soil of the sandy arena of that con cockpit of conflict around which the nations sit, watching the ancient drama of the Eastern question just as they did in the 19th century when this question perplexed the finest diplomatic minds of Europe, who nevertheless proved incapable of preventing the outbreak of general war.
Well, <laughs> thank you so much for that presentation. That was uh, enlightening and delightful, and, and uh, all of the illustrations that you have shown on the screen are available for purchase in the back, and to the back here to uh, uh, sign this book uh, now. So thank you okay. for coming. Okay. Thank you all for coming.